Okay, for this talk, I promised to talk about a uh, domain-specific language that appears to have no name and yet has been widely used for decades. And I want to use this uh, not so much because the language itself is of uh, the most interest to me, although I think it's a very interesting language, but I want to explore its details because I think this can serve as a case study that may guide us in the design of domain-specific languages in the future. Okay, in order to introduce this language, I need to talk about LaTeX and how BibTeX works. Okay, uh, if you've ever used LaTeX, you know that you take your LaTeX source file, which is, has the extension .tech typically, and it contains the text of your paper and formatting commands, and also cite commands that indicate where you want bibliographic references inserted. And then typically toward the end of that source file, there is a bibliography command <clears throat> and a bibliography style command. And the bibliography style command says what style of bibliographic formatting you want for the references. And the name in the bibliography command gives the name of a file that contains your BibTeX database, which is a list of possible uh, uh, other papers that you might want to refer to. When you run it through LaTeX, you get a typeset paper in the form of a .ps or a .pdf file. And you also get this aux file that has auxiliary data. And the reason for this is that sometimes things have to be processed multiple passes. And in this auxiliary data file are recorded every site key that occurred and the name of the bib database and the name of the bib style. And so this data is transferred by LaTeX from LaTeX source file to the aux file as you make your first pass through LaTeX. Once you've done that, then you run this separate program called BibTeX and it takes in the auxiliary data file and gets certain information from it. It uses the name of the bib database to find the .bib file that contains the bibliographic database. It also uses the name of the bib style to identify another thing called the bibliographic style file. And given that information, it produces a BBL file which contains bibliographic references extracted from the database. And uh, along with those references are certain bib item commands that in effect define tags for those entries, uh, which can be used as labels. Then you take your LaTeX source file and make a second pass through LaTeX, and it's different this time, because this time the .bbl file exists, so when LaTeX processes the source file and the aux file, it also reads in the bibliographic references file. And from the BBL file comes the material that becomes the references at the end in your bibliography section. But it also looks at the bib item commands, and those commands produce data that goes back into the aux file. And in order to process that information, you need to make a third pass through LaTeX. This time the aux file has the bib item data, and that information is used to construct the actual citations in the text. And this works very much like the, uh, the, the uh, ref commands for things you have labeled, such as uh, uh, figures and uh, tables and things. So in all, you have to run your source file at least three times through LaTeX, and after, before the last two, you must have run BibTeX, so that the uh, bibliographic information can cycle from the .bbl file through the .aux file and around a couple of times. Okay, so that's the story. Now here's what's in the bibliographic database file, the .bib file, and uh, if you've ever used this, this seems familiar, but I want to go over it. Up at the top, there can be a preamble command, which indicates sort of tech material that needs to be copied into your, um, into your uh, tech source, actually goes in the .bbl file. This is information that might be typeset before the bibliography section begins. There are also string commands that in effect define abbreviations. You can let CACM stand for communications of the ACM. So you don't need to type that over and over in your database file. And then I have here examples of two books of works that I might like to cite. These are two of my favorites. One is uh, the, the book by Wolf et al. on the design of an optimizing compiler. And I call this the Bliss Compiler. And for this, I provide the title and the author and the ISBN and other information. So the format of this entry is a type indicator, in this case, book, a label that I can use to refer to it, and then key value pairs. And this one is, is formatted nicely with indentation to make it more readable. This other one down here shows that the indentation doesn't have to be pretty. Here I've got an article. This is Robert Morse's article on counting large numbers of events in small registers. 
also known as the paper on approximate counters. And this appeared in CACM, and I was able to just say journal equals CACM. I didn't actually have to write out the entire thing. And when this bibliographic entry is processed, uh, this string name CACM gets substituted by its expansion. And similarly, um, when I say month equals oct, oct is another one of these string names and it gets substituted for October. A typical database file will have all 12 uh, months defined like that. Okay, and then in the .tech file, I can say things like backslash site counters, which refers to this tag, or site list compiler, which refers to this tag. And that's an indication that I want this bibliographic material to appear in my bibliography and that I want in the text for uh, references from, uh, from the text to point to those bibliographic entries. Okay, the whole point of this very complicated framework is that I can use one bibliography file and use it with multiple pa papers so I can build up a database of my favorite bibliographic citations and use it in multiple papers. And furthermore, I don't need to decide ahead of time what the bibliographic references are going to look like in the bibliographic session. Instead, that is dictated by the bibliographic style file. And because different publications have different rules for what those ought to look like, you can capture those. So for example, for communications of the ACM, there is a style file. For uh, physics publications, there is a style file. For chemistry publications, there's another style file. Uh, for um, uh, psychology, they've, they've got their own style files and so forth. So here are examples of this very simple, uh, highlighted here in the yellow. This is a my tech input file, it's very short. It, and it actually has one sentence of text. We use the Bliss compiler to compile our implementation of approximate counters. And there are two citations here. And here are the references. And this is compiled using the bibliographic style Angu. And this is a very abbreviated form. It shows the uh, names, only the last names of the authors and otherwise just initials. And it gives the name of the publisher and the year, but not much other information. For example, the ISBN got completely ignored. Similarly for the CACM article, it doesn't even give the title of the article. It just says it's in CACM and here is the, uh, it's in volume 21 and here's the page numbers and that's all you need to know. You can go look, that's barely enough information to go look it up, but it's very concise. On the other hand, I can change just one word in my input file and say, instead of the bibliography style Angu, I want to use E-Ray, then it's, uh, it's uh, appears very much the same up here, but uh, now I am seeing the title of this, that CACM article. The references got sorted into a different order. They got sorted alphabetically by author instead of by order of occurrence in the text. I'm seeing the DOI for the CACM article, but I'm not seeing the ISBN for the book. Okay, and the year appears in different places. So this is a different bibliography format. Here's a third one. This is NatDIN. Uh, this is used for German publications. And you'll see that in the citations, instead of saying Wolf et al, it says Wolf und andere. UA for the German, you know, and others. And uh, the, the uh, last names of the authors appear in caps and small caps and uh, in a very specific style. And the ISBN for the book is now appearing. And in this fourth style, plain NAT, which is a widely used one, instead of using author and year, it just uses a numeric citation up here in the text. It has sorted them into author order and uh, the references are indicated by one and two rather than by uh, author name. And here the ISBN is showing up. And so all these differences in how my bibliography look are accounted for by the content of the bibliography style file. Okay, so let's go back to how BibTeX works. We've already seen this slide. And uh, this is one way of looking at it that is correct, but I'm gonna show you a better way of looking at it. Here's how it really works. BibTeX does take in the, the aux file, uses that to find the database, and then it constructs a relevant subset of the database, that, that is the elements of the database that are actually referred to by the paper. That is then fed into the bibliographic style file to produce the BBL file. What do I mean by it's fed into the BST file? What I mean is that file is actually a program and it's executed. And there's a slight lie up here that I've corrected. The whole process is actually under the control of this BST file being interpreted as a program by BibTeX, 
one of the things that it can do is trigger the read of the database. A read command can say, okay, BibTeX, please construct for me the relevant subset of the database and feed that to me for further processing. And then this program does the rest of the work. So the domain specific language that I've been talking about that doesn't have a name, I will call the BibTeX style language. It's a very funny little domain specific language. It was created by Oren Potashnik and Leslie Lamport in 1985. And uh, version 0.98F was released in March of 85. There's a slight improvement about three years later. And it really hasn't changed much in the last 33 years since then. In 2003, Potashnik uh, published a sort of retrospective and future looking paper which is now famous in BibTeX circles, BibTeX yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And this proposed 19 sets of changes to the BibTeX style language to make it better. As far as I know, this set of changes was never actually implemented, but these ideas have been floating around. An actual update to the language was made in March of 2010, version 0.99D was released uh, because uh, they found that they were people were beginning to use very long URLs in bibliography entries and uh, BibTeX wasn't breaking those URLs across line boundaries in the best way. So they fixed that up a little bit. But otherwise, the language has changed hardly at all for 33 years. So I want to praise this BibTeX style language. It's been a workhorse used every day around the world for a third of a century. It does its job. Uh, there are dozens and dozens of bibliographic styles programmed in this language. And people use them, and I think the language is successful because all those users really don't have to know that that language is there. They just use the style files and they work. There have been many sophisticated replacements proposed either for this style language or for BibTeX itself, and they're out there and people are using them, but somehow these improvements have not displaced good old BibTeX. So on the one hand, BibTeX is a big success story. On the other hand, I want to try to take an objective view of this domain specific language as a language and try to critique it and assess what is good about it and what is not so good in the hopes of learning something for the future. So that is, that is the essence of this talk. So all that is by way of background. So now I need to teach you this language because I assume that most of you are not experts in this language or what it looks like. Fortunately, it's a very small language. So I'm gonna teach you the whole language in about 15 minutes, maybe 20. Okay, in a BST program, there are four data types. You can have strings of ASCII characters. Remember, this is designed back in the 80s. This is before Unicode. So we have ASCII characters to work with. Uh, we have integers. In the original BibTeX, they were 16-bit integers. Nowadays, you can count on them being 32 bits. There are functions, and there's a special value empty, which you might think of as null or nil or something like that. Empty is the value of a database entry field for which no value is supplied. So those are the four data types. Here is the data environment in which a BST program runs. First, there's a set of named things and there is just one namespace. There are functions, there are macros and macros are just named strings. You can think of them as string variables except they're a special kind of string variable and they are initialized by those at string commands in the dot, dot bib database. So things like oct for October or CACM for communications of the ACM. They are called strings in the context of the .bib file, but in the context of the BST program, they're actually referred to as macros. So don't be fooled. These macros do not take arguments. They're just names that can expand into strings. Then there are variables and they can be of two data types. There can be string variables and integer variables. And then there are database entry variables. When you pull in the relevant subset of the database, entries are made available. And when you process an entry, you can see the fields of the database entry. These are the key value pairs and the keys are the names of the database variables and the values are the, uh, are the uh, values of those variables. In addition, there are also per entry string variables and per integer, integer variables that are declared by the BSD program. These are extra working variables that can't appear in the database, but you have one instance of that variable for every database entry. And this is used for things like um, constructing sort keys for the database entries. Okay. Uh, the structure of the program is that it consists of a series of top level program commands. And then within those, those commands, functions are used. So you can 
have one declaration of the database fields and the relevant entry variables, and this is an entry command. And that is followed by three groups of names and braces, the names of the fields, and these are the keys that can appear in key value pairs in the .bib file. Actually, the .bib file can have any key value pairs. It's just that if a key value pair has a key that is not in this list, then this program is going to ignore them. They'll just never, never be seen. And then you could declare the per entry integer variables and the per entry string variables. So here's a typical example. Uh, I might say that for my database, I expect database entries to have key, key value pairs whose keys are things like author, title, journal, volume, number, year, month, day, and so forth. I will need an auxiliary integer variable called citation order, which is used to help me figure out in what order to, to sort them. And I also need sort.year and sort.label, which are strings, which I will use for, for constructing sort keys. Secondly, at the top level of the program, you can declare global variables. These are variables that don't, are not associated with any database entry. You can declare integer variables, you can declare string variables, and you can actually declare macros. So in the BST program, you can declare Jan to be a macro that expands to January. If there is also an at string definition in the .bib file that defines a definition for Jan, it will override this macro definition in the program. So this is a way of providing default values in case the .bib file doesn't provide them. But if it does, it overrides them. Ah, the most interesting one. We can declare functions and declare a function we have two things in, in braces. First, the name of the function, and finally, a list of functions to call. This is the body of the function. The language is a stack language. Oh, and I think, let me back up because I forgot to talk about that. In the data environment for BST program, besides all these named things, there is an unnamed list of chosen database entries, and there is also a stack. This language is very much like PostScript, a language that was designed only a few years earlier than this language. So that style of language design was in the air in the late 70s and early 80s. And so I, bel I believe that BibTech was modeled very much on PostScript or the PostScript style of language. On the stack, each stack slot could contain any one of the four data types, type string, integer, function, or empty. And primitive functions take arguments on the stack and return the results there. Okay, so here are defined functions. And the way this works, is that uh, when you invoke the function, then you simply execute its body one entry at a time. So here's a sample function named double. And what it does is whatever's on top of the stack, it duplicates it and then calls the add function, thereby adding the two duplicates together to get a single value again, thereby, thereby multiplying it by two. Here's a very useful function called not. If it finds something positive on the stack, it will push a zero and it finds something negative on the stack, it will push a one, uh, non positive on the stack it will push a one. And this is actually conditional. You write if statements with the word if at the end. And the reason for that is that if is a function that will take a, pre a Boolean value on the stack and these two uh, bodies, and it will choose which one to execute based on the value up here. So this is a way of inverting a Boolean value. We'll actually see more about, about if later. And here's a function called increment count, and it just takes the global variable count, then pushes a one on the stack. So it pushes count on the stack, it pushes one on the stack, adds them together, uses quote to push the name of the variable on the stack, and then does the assignment operation. And so execution of a function body is just done by chunking along, executing one token at a time, and operating on the stack. Finally, it's forbidden for functions to be recursive, and this is accomplished simply by the fact that the name of the function is not in scope in its body. Okay, uh, the an, a fourth thing that I can have at the top level of a program is execute. And I can just say execute a function name and that function will get called. And this is kind of how you, you actually start executing code. When you execute a function, the database entry variables are not available to the called function, only global variables. This is what you use when you run a, want to run code, but you're initializing or cleaning up. You're not actually looking at the database entries. Finally, there are some commands that work with a list of database entries. There's the read command, which I've already alluded. Its job is to tell BibTeX to go ahead and read the .bib file. And it has already read the .ox file. It did that at the very beginning. It had to do that in order to find the .bst file. And it uses the site information in the .ox file and the contents of the .bib file to figure out which database entries are relevant 
It then in effect creates, creates a sub database for the rest of the program to work on. There's also the sort command, which instructs BibTeX to sort the list of database entries. It turns out that every database entry has an implicit field called sort key dollar sign. And that is a string. And that is the key on which the database entries will get sorted. And you can call sort more than once. You can keep resorting the database for various purposes in order to uh, calculate various things before you do the final sort and emit them. Lastly, there is something that is very much like execute, but it, instead of executing the function once, it executes it once for each database entry in order, in the order in which it's been sorted into. So iterate executes the function once for each database entry going forward, and reverse executes the function on every database entry but going backwards through the database. And in this, these cases, the entry variables of the database entries are available to the called function. OK, so that's what the top level program structure looks like. So the typical structure of BSD file is you've got one entry command to define the database structure. Then you do some initialization. You declare your string variables, your integer variables, and you can declare functions and macros. You do one read command to set up the list of referenced entries. And it's at that point that the macro and string references that occur in the .bib file are processed in constructing these, the, the uh, subset of database entries. That is then followed by a mixture of execute, iterate, reverse, and sort commands for operating on the database. And if you want to, you can have more string, integer, and function declarations that occur later. And the last four lines almost look something like this. Iterate over a special built-in function called call type. And we'll talk about call type later. And then some post-processing. You declare a function which is conventionally called end bib, and then you execute it. And typically what it does is emit a new line, emits backslash end the bibliography, which is a standard environment. And then you uh, write that out, and then you have another new line. OK, so that's the end of the processing. The beginning, that's more complicated. OK, so we've talked about the overall structure of the program at sort of a statement level. Now let's talk about all the primitive functions. And once we know all the primitive functions available, and there are only a few dozen, then you know the entire language. OK, and I have these on 11 slides. So first of all, there are simple functions that take, all these functions take their arguments on the stack and return their values. There are simple arithmetic functions. You can compare two fun integers for equality or to see if they're less than or greater than. And this will put, it will pop two integers off the stack. And if they are, uh, if they compare true, then a one is pushed on the stack and otherwise a zero is pushed on the stack. You get a Boolean result. You can also add the top two integers on the stack and that leaves the sum on the stack. You can also subtract two integers. Uh, the one on the top of the stack is subtracted from the one just below it and the difference is left on the stack. There are also a couple of string functions. You can compare two strings for quality and you again get a Boolean result. Or you can use the asterisk to concatenate two strings, and it leaves the result on the stack. So notice a couple of things here. Number one, the, the function called equal sign is actually polymorphic. It can operate either on two integers or on two strings. And that's unusual. There are only two other polymorphic uh, pri primitive operations. We'll get to those later. The other is notice that the asterisk is not polymorphic. You can use it to concatenate strings. But the design of this language chose not to give us an integer multiply. It turns out you really don't need that very much when constructing bibliographies. You might need to um, convert a string you know, from decimal to binary or something. But you can program that. So here's a function called times 10, which is basically what you need. And we, when you come in, we expect to have an integer on the stack. And what we do is we just double it. OK, so we've doubled it. Now we need to multiply it by 5. And to do that, we duplicate it. We double the duplicate price to multiply it by four. And then we do an addition. And the result of that is so duplicate double double plus multiplies by five. And so here we've programmed a multiplication by 10. No problem. No reason to put a multiply uh, uh, operation as primitive in the language. And already you have a flavor of why this is a domain specific language. You could also imagine to have been, it, it, it was constructed by an agile programming process where they were driven by examples. And you just didn't put a feature in the language until an example actually needed it. OK, there are stack manipulation operations. And these are uh, sort of a minimal subset. PostScript has a much richer set of stack manipulation operations. What this language has is duplicate to push a copy of the top stack item. Or you can swap the top two stack items. You pop them off and push them back in the other order. 
And you can also just pop and discard the stop, top stack item. There's also provision for some type testing. You can look at the top stack item and you can tell whether it's the value of a missing field. And you'll get a one if it is and zero if it isn't. You, there's also a primitive called empty and that does a more complicated test. And that pushes a one if the top of the stack is either the value of a missing field or a string that contains no non-white space characters. So it could be an empty string, it could be a string containing just blanks. And this empty dollar sign primitive kind of lumps those in together with missing field, because very often you want to treat those as essentially meaning the same, nothing is provided. But you do have the choice of these two operations. Now I'll make two observations here. One is that uh, officially the name of a, the value of a missing field is empty but the name of the predicate that tests for that is an empty dollar, it's called missing dollar. I don't know why, but that's a possible source of terminological confusion. It's a, it's a second or third order phenomenon, but as a language designer, would not, I would not have chosen the names this way. I would call the thing that tests for the empty value, empty dollars. And I probably would have called this one missing or, or something else like that. The other thing to notice is that there are not a richer set of type testing primitives. And we'll get to that later but there's not a way to find out, for example, whether or not something is a string or an integer. Okay, we look at seeing primitive functions for popping from the stack and manipulating the stack. We have to, get, have, to have ways to get stuff onto the stack. And there's a fairly rich set of, of, of these. The syntax sharp sign followed by digits will push an integer literal onto the stack. If I put, I'm sorry, I've got a magic mouse and I keep uh, glitching on it. Okay, back to where we were. There we are. I will try not to touch, touch the top of my magic mouse, which tends to scroll. I can have a string literal in double quotes that pushes a string onto the stack. If I put a list of function embraces, which we, I referred to before as like being the body of a function, this is actually a function literal. I mean, a function just consists of a list of functions. So this pushes this function onto the stack. If I just simply write the name of a variable, the, the value of the variable is pushed on the stack. If I write the name of a field, the value of the field is pushed on the stack. And if the field didn't have a value, then we get empty. I can also use a single quote. If I write quote and the name of a function, it pushes the function of that name onto the stack. And that's occasionally handy. If I quote a variable name or a field name, what it does is a push a function that if executed will then push the value of that variable or field. This is mostly used in conjunction with the assignment function because we need to have the name, but it's actually very general. If I want to push a function onto the stack whose job is to push the value of the variable, I can just use this quote mark syntax uh, instead of putting the name of the variable in the braces, I can do it either way. Finally, there's this primitive operation that pushes a string containing one double quote character. That's because I believe there's actually not a way to escape double quotes within these strings, or if there is, it's ugly. I'd have to go back and research that. But there is this primitive that will push a string containing one double quote character. And then you can use the concatenate operation to concatenate st string, this string with on other strings. That's how you get double quotes into strings. Now this actually didn't have to be primitive. It could have been defined this way because there is something that will, there is a primitive that we'll see later that will convert an integer into a character. So I could have defined the quote primitive as simply push a 34 onto the stack and then convert that to character. But they chose to provide as a primitive. Okay, so here are some examples of useful functions uh, which we actually see in typical bibliographic style files. Here's a function called parenthesize. It assumes that you get a string on the stack and what it does is it pushes a left parenthesis string on the stack, swaps it so it's below, that is to the left of that string, and then concatenates it. Then it pushes a right parenthesis on the stack and concatenates it on the right. So it takes a string and slaps parentheses around it. Very useful. This is a very similar one called italicize, except instead of putting parentheses around it, it puts backslash emph brace and a brace around the string. And here's one that's used for formatting titles of books and things like that. Take the title field from the database entry, italicize it, and then call this funny thing called add period that adds a period unless there's already a period there. So that's a, this is a very common kind of thing to see in these style files. More primitive functions. 
Uh, colon equals assumes on the stack you've got a, a value and then a push function for variable or field, and it does the assignment. Here is control structure. The function if assumes that the stack has an integer and two functions. It pops all three of them. And then if the integer was positive, it calls function one, and otherwise it calls function two. So notice that Booleans are, Booleans are conditioned on being positive or non-positive rather than being zero or non-zero, but that's workable. In any case, you can think of one as being true and zero as being false. The while function takes two functions on the stack. It calls function one and then looks on the top of the stack, there better be an integer there, which presumably function one left there. So think of function one as being the predicate. And if the value is positive, then we call function two and we repeat the process. That gives you a while loop. And finally, there's this skip function. It does absolutely nothing. And what it's mostly used for is an if statements. If you need a function that doesn't do anything, you could have written empty braces, but you can also just write quote skip dollar sign. And for some reason, that is the idiomatic style, probably because it saves space. So here's an example. Here's a more complicated uh, definition of format title. We grab the title field and call a subsidiary defined function call and ask whether it's empty or unknown, which does even more processing than, than just missing dollars or empty dollars rather. If it's empty or none, we push an empty string. And how do I know that it's an if? I tell by the indentation. Here's a predicate. Here's the matching dollars if down here. Here's the then part, which is to push an empty string. And here's the else part. And the else part is, let's take the title and italicize it. Let's see if there's a title add-on field. Well, if it's empty or unknown, we skip this part. Here I've written quote skip, there's an if here. But if it's not empty or unknown, then we concatenate on a space and then we take the title add-on, parenthesize it, and then concatenate that to the title. And then finally, we take the whole shebang and add period to it. So now you can see how we can begin to use if statements to build up fairly complicated if-then-else structures. And a lot of the work of a bibliographic style file is just doing a lot of special case checking and occasionally iterating over a list. And that's why the main control structures are if and while. So the assumption is that the database entries actually contain most of the stuff and mostly just need to make some decisions about whether to parenthesize things, italicize things, decide in what order to concatenate things, and then we spit it out and that produces the BBL file. Okay, so more primitive functions. There's a way to get a substring of a string. So given a string on the stack, a start position and a length, it computes the substring assuming that the elements of the string are ASCII characters. It uses one based indexing, if the start position is negative, then it's measured from the end and the length extends backwards. So you can take substrings starting from either end of the string. And you don't tend to get error messages. It's very tolerant of overshoot. If the length is too long, it just pretends the length is shorter, things like that. Now there's this different thing called text prefix. And it takes a string and a length and it pushes a string containing the first len text characters a string. And this is not the same as taking the substring that starts at position one and is of length len. And the reason is because text prefix looks for text characters, not ASCII characters. And text characters means being a bit smart about text syntax. So if it sees something like open brace backslash hat, open brace O close close, that whole thing is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, it's nine ASCII characters, but it counts as just one text character. There's also this thing called text length, which tells you how long the string is considered as text characters. Curiously, there's no primitive function that gives you the length of a string considered as ASCII characters. I guess they found they didn't need it. It's also not that hard to program if you really do need it. But I found myself in my time programming these bibliographic style files, and I have programmed several of them. I didn't need that function, so. If you lift it up, fine. And in fact, here's the definition of string dot length considered as ASCII characters. It's only about six lines of code. I'll run through it briefly. Uh, you push a zero on the stack, and then we're going to increment that zero for every character we see. Then we swap it to get, to get it below the strings. So we're keeping the counter just below the string on the stack. Then we have this while loop. We duplicate the string, and if it's not empty, then we're going to um, push a two on the stack and then global max, which is a special variable that is the maximum length any string can ever be. It's about, it's like 2000 or 4000 or something. 
and then you take the substring. So in effect, you're taking the tail of the string. We swap that back. Now we've got the counter on top. We add one to the counter, and then we swap it back, and we go around the while loop again. And when finally the string is empty, we've got the, the we pop that empty string. The number we wanted was on the stack. That's the length of the string in ASCII characters. Okay, more primitive functions. There are type conversions between int and characters. We can convert an ASCII value to a single character string. We can convert a single character string to an ASCII value. Int to stir converts an integer to a signed decimal representation. There's no function that can takes a string and converts it back to an int. You can program it if you want to. Turns out you don't need it that much. Okay, here's some rather more domain specific primitive functions. Here's one that'll change the case of a string. It takes a string and then kind of a control operand that says exactly how you want it converted. Do you want it converted to uppercase, lowercase, title case, that kind of thing. Add period is a very special purpose thing that appends a period to a string unless the last character in the string, not counting closed braces, is already a period or a question mark or an exclamation point. So this handles titles that ends in question mark and things like that. It doesn't handle titles that end in a double quote. <laughs> so it doesn't quite always do the right thing, but it does the right thing 80% of the time. Here's this width primitive and it takes a string and it gives you back an integer, which is the physical width of the string in hundredths of a point. If you typeset that string in the June 1987 version of the font CMR10. So I think they're trying to figure out what the width of a bibliographic label would be likely to be in case you're worrying about the indentation of a bibliographic en reference entry. You know, that kind of stuff. This isn't much used anymore because you really can't count on people using the, the computer modern Roman fonts anymore. But that seemed to be a useful thing to build in at the time. And that means that, in fact, the widths of all the characters in this font are built into BibTeX. Here's a weird thing called Purify that takes out uh, removes from the string all the punctuation characters. It leaves in the letters, numbers. It leaves in white space and hyphens and ties, but turns all those into white space. And it leaves in a few other characters. And what purify is for is for constructing a good sort key from things you might've pulled out of the database entry, such as the author's last name, such as the year, anyway. So for some reason they called it purify. Uh, here is a very complicated function that converts to lowercase. And uh, I think I'll just leave it in the slide for you to contemplate at your leisure. Uh, yeah, in fact, it doesn't handle all the, um, all the cases that BibTeX primitive does because it doesn't handle text characters in quite the right way. I, I didn't, uh, but this is an example of what it might look like if you try to program it for yourself. So this is a moderately complicated thing. It's really hard to get right. So it's probably a good idea it was built in as a primitive so you didn't have to keep re reprogramming it yourself. That was the main point of this example. Okay, there are two primitive functions that are specifically designed to operate on names of authors. Very important thing to do, very specific to the domain. These operate on a string of the form name and name and name and name. So the num names primitive will tell you the number of names in the string. So it goes through the string looking for occurrences of the word and that are delimited by white space and are not within braces. And it finds the number of such ands and returns one more than the number of ands essentially. That tells you the number of names. And then there is this extremely complicated thing called format.name dollars. And given a string, an index k, which is an integer, and a format control string, it extracts the kth name from the string, decomposes it into its first, von, last, and junior parts, and then reassembles those parts into a new string under the control of the format string format. And its job is to let you take a name from the database if it's already inverted to uninverted, if it's not inverted to invert it, to decide whether you want full first names or just initials. Uh, this is the whole thing that, that handles names. And it turns out the implementation of this one primitive is about one sixth of the total code size of BibTeX. This works for many names, but not quite hundred percent. In particular, it doesn't work for my name. It does a bad job of handling names that have junior without a comma in front of them. So maybe this is why I've become so fascinated with this language because I've got a pet peeve against it. I don't think so, but I, but I really would like to solve the problem for other people like me who use junior without a comma in front of it. And 
there are other kinds of names it doesn't handle well either. We'll talk about that later. Now, okay, so I've talked some about primitive functions. There are just a few more, but let me pause here to ask the question. This is a, this is a language that is based around functions and you can even push functions under the stack. So is this a functional language? Well, the first question to ask is given a function, can we call it? We have seen no primitive that we'll call a function. It turns out I can program it. We can define one and I can even name it so that it appears to be primitive, which is one of my uh, a criteria for whether a language is extensible. Can you make a defined function look like a primitive? And indeed, I can find a function called call and implement that I push a one onto the stack. I could have pushed a zero. I can push any integer on the stack because I'm going to take that function, duplicate it, and then feed it to if. I really don't care which copy if selects. And then if will take care of doing the job of calling the function, yay. So that's the kind of tricky uh, thing you can do. Okay, now that I know I can call a function once I've got it on the stack, I can write map. So here's a, here's a function called map that will map a function over a string and as an example, given the string ABC, if I put the string ABC on the stack and then say quote parenthesize to put the function on the stack and then call map, it will parenthesize each character for me. And here's the implementation of that. And the main thing to notice is that I'm constantly using swap and duplicate and swap and call to manipulate that function on the stack. So sometimes I want the function on top so I can call it. Sometimes I want to stick it underneath the string that I'm processing. But it's, it's the same game as for um, I did for count figuring out the length of a string. I've got a couple of working variables on the stack and I can get access to either one by using swap at the correct points. And this thing is using a while loop. And as long as the string is not empty, I keep going. And for each character, I duplicate it and I do some processing and I'm not going to go into the details of that. You see the overall structure of the code. So next question is, well, if there's a functional language and I can put functions on the stack, can I decide whether it's Turing complete by defining a, a language of combinators? So I took this as a challenge and it turns out I and K are fairly easy. I is the identity function. That's great, that's skip. I didn't even have to give it a name. Skip dollars is I. And if I want to define the combinator K, it takes two arguments and returns the first one. Great, I just pop the second one. I leave the first one on the stack, I'm done. The S combinator, well, it takes three arguments, X, Y, and Z, and it calls X twice, first on Z, first, I'm sorry, it calls X on Z, then it calls Y on Z, and get back two functions, we call the first function on the second function. This is the real meat of the combinatory calculus. Well, fine, I will, I'll take Z and I will um, put it into a global variable. I'll take this, ver take this variable name Z and pop that topmost operand and stick it there. Then I'll put Z back on the stack, swap it, and call it, thereby uh, invoking Y on it. Then I need to do a swap to get X at the top. I push Z again and do a swap and call X on Z. And now I, now I do call. And uh, the reason uh, it looks like I've gotten them the X applied to Z and Y applied to Z backwards on the stack. But the reason is that call takes its function, has the argument and then the function rather than the function and the argument. So, so the call dollars primitive takes its arguments backwards. So that's what's going on here. But there's a problem here. This works fine as long as, as Y and Z are, as long as Z is a number, say, or a string. But Z might be a function. And I can't put Z in a global variable because I don't have any way to declare a global variable type function. The language only gives me global variables of type integer and type string. So I'm stuck. I can manipulate functions, but I have to keep them. The stack is the only place I can keep them. There's no way to stick them anyplace else. There's also a, a, a scoping problem, which is that Z is a global variable. It's not scoped to this function. And so if I nest uses of S, I've got problems there. And I, if Z is down there on the stack, I can't even get at it because it's the third thing on the stack. And I can only get at the top th two things on the stack using swap. I wasn't given something to rotate the top three elements of the stack, for example. Okay, so this doesn't work after all. But there's actually a deeper problem, which is that when I'm using the combinatory calculus as a target language, say for translating lambda calculus, I depend critically on being able to curry the K and S combinators. And these definitions that I gave you don't curry properly. I need to be able to call K with an argument and get back a function. So let's try that. Let's try to redefine this. K is something that takes X and I'll put that in the variable X. And then I return a function that when I get that other value pops it and then returns X. 
But this doesn't work at all because in this language, all variables are global and functions don't have environments. The body of function is purely a list of functions. There is no associated environment. So there's no way to return a function that actually remembers any calculated values. So maybe this isn't really a functional language after all. Maybe instead of being functions, these should have been called procedures or codes or something. Maybe I was misled by the terminology, the uh, Maybe I was misled by knowing too much 20 or 30 years later about terminology someone in the 1980s used to describe their language. <laughs> Have to be careful when describing uh, historical artifacts. Okay, a few more domain-specific primitive functions. Uh, if I am executing under the control of iterator reverse, there's a database entry available, and these primitives deal with database entries. I can get the string, which is the citation key for the current entry. That's the name I used in the backslash site command. So I've got access to that string. I can also, also have access to the string, which is the type of the current database entry. That would be something like book or article in proceedings. Um, there's also this very specialized things called call type. And remember I said earlier at the end of the, of the .bst file, you usually iterate over call type. What that thing does is for the current entry, if its type is not an empty string, that is, it is a, its type is actually the name of a function that I have defined, then I call that function. So in the .bst file, there will actually be functions named book and article and in proceedings. And when I need to process a book, I will call the function called book. And when I need to call the to process an article, I will call the function called article. And if the type of the database entry has not been defined by a, as a function, then there's a default function called default.type, and it gets called instead. So there's always a function available. Well, you better define default.type. There's always a function available to process each database entry in this way. Finally, there's a specialized primitive called preamble that just pushes a string that is the concatenation of all the arguments to the at sign preamble command in the .bib file. These are ways of getting at parts of the, of the .bib file. Okay, so I've got ways of processing my input. I've got ways of doing stuff on the stack. How does output happen? Well, there are two primitives for that. I can write a string to the, to the .bbl file, and I can write a new line to the .bbl file. And that's all I need, right? Done. Very straightforward. And finally, there are three primitives that, are, that help with error reporting and debugging. There is this thing called warning that will pop the stock, top stack item, which must be a string, prepends the string warning dash dash to it, prints it on the, output, on the output log, and also increments the count of warnings, which has to do with final error reporting at the end. There is a way of popping and printing the top item on the stack on the terminal for debugging. Notice that this is polymorphic. It can print either an integer or a string. It will actually print a function too, but it'll just say, oh, I've got a function. So a great feature here is that you can drop something like, I reached point A and top dollar sign anywhere in your code, even in the middle of what you think of as an expression. And it will just print out that string and it's otherwise invisible. Or you can, uh, you can write duplicate top and print out what's on the top of the stack. And as long as it's an integer or string, you will successfully print it. But I am unable to write an improved version for myself because the language provides me with no way to test whether it's an integer or a string. So I, I can't do that. And then this, there's this debugging thing called stack dollar sign. And it prints the entire contents of the stack for debugging. Possibly a convincing limitation as it prints them, it pops them. So once I do this, uh, there's really not much I can do except uh, you know, crash a, a, in a train wreck because I can't proceed with execution anymore. I printed the stack, I've used it up. And I would like to print it, make, I would like to construct a version of stack that would do this for me, but retain the stack, or maybe just print the five, five top items of the stack. But I can't do that for two reasons. One, as the polymorphism problem, I can't tell whether any given entry is a string or an integer or a function. And the second is I got no way to tell how many items are in the stack. I can't even tell whether the stack is empty or not. At least not without, you know, crashing and burning. I can try pop, but if something isn't there, I lose. Okay, so that's what's there. You now know the entire BibTeX language. Now I want to talk briefly about how I tried to use it uh, for a project. I was constructing a rather grand 
an improvement of ACM standard reference format style for the recent History of Langu Programming Languages conference, which is uh, the printed papers were published nine months ago. The conference itself will be in three months from now. And uh, there are a couple of big tasks I tackled. One was to provide uh, dates in full ISO 8601 format. So the standard uh, bibliography styles up until now allow you to provide year, month, and day fields. And that's fine for printed papers. But we find nowadays people are citing things like websites and URLs, and they're even citing uh, blog posts and specific email messages. And it's really helpful to give a complete timestamp. You want the hour, minute, and second, not just the day, month, and year. So I hauled off and implemented the, you could just say date, and you can put any date in ISO 8601 format in there, and it parses it and figures it out. So that was a fun programming exercise. There's a few pages of code. But one problem is that the macros are inaccessible to the programmer. I wanted to parse a date like this, and where I saw one zero, I'd like to go off, and if the macro oct is defined, substitute the value of the macro oct as a string in my formatting of the date. But it turns out the program doesn't have access to those macro definitions. Only the substitution process that constructs the subset of the database has access to those definitions. It would have been very easy to add another, uh, another thing that can push an item on the stack. If you write the name of a macro in a program, it pushes its value on the stack. They just didn't provide that in the language because they, apparently they were, never ran across a use case. Now I've got a use case and I'm stuck. I got around it by extending the format of ISO 8601 slightly. So instead of having to put hyphens around the month number, I could just put the text string for the month there. So I could write 2019 January 02. And the idea is that in the .bib file, I would write it this way as date 2020 sharp sign Jan sharp sign 02. It turns out that in a .bib file, sharp sign is a string concatenation operator, not asterisk. I don't know why, but there is a concatenation operator. So if I write this in the .bib file, then .bib text substitution process will substitute the macro value for the macro name here. The result will be a string that looks like that, and I can then parse it from there, from within the, the style program. Okay, so these are the kinds of workarounds you do. The other thing I tried to tackle was providing better support for East Asian, Spanish, and junior without common names. The problem I ran into there is that format.name dollars has a very specific built-in theory of name parts and it's not extensible. And this theory of name parts does not deal well with Spanish names that have multiple surnames. It does not deal well with East Asian names that might have the surname before the first name or the, before the given name. And it just does not deal with juniors that don't have commas. So there's a, there's a very straightforward solution to this, which is to completely re-implement the format.name dollars primitives in the style language. And you can do this. I haven't finished yet. I estimate it will be about 20 pages of style file code. It'll be comparable in size to the, the, the code in, the, in, in Pascal in BibTeX itself. So we can do this. It seems a shame to have to do this because I'm not changing most of its functionality. It would have been a lot easier for me if the three things that format.name does were three separate primitive functions. If there were something that selected the name giving n, then something that decomposed the name into its parts, and then something that did the formatting, then I could, then I could re, re just replace the parts decomposition thing, which would take care of most of it, and let format name parts do its thing. I would really like to update this as well, but if I could just change the thing that tears it apart into its four parts. I could get, I could solve about 90% of the remaining problem. So uh, there is a lesson here that we'll come to later. So I want to conclude my talk by, with a few observations. What have we learned about the design of this very specific domain specific language? Well, first of all, it solved pretty completely the problem as they understood it in the early 1980s and solved it well enough that we've learned to live with it since then. And it does provide some facilities for workarounds, mostly having to do with putting things in braces. But it doesn't solve everything. So my observation number one, from today's point of view, a primitive that is too specific may end up being ignored or completely re-implemented, in which case, what good is it having in the language? So for example, add period could have handled more cases. You could have handled adding a comma instead of a period. Sometimes you need that. Uh, format names doesn't handle certain names properly, and suggested workarounds don't work in all cases. 
So each of these primitives could have been made more general or could have been torn apart into constituent pieces to provide building blocks for someone who comes along later and wants to build a variant. And there's this tension. Do you provide the thing that's absolutely correct right now, or do you provide building blocks for later that where those using those building blocks might be a little clunkier now? That is a design tension that the designer of a DSL has to take into consideration. If a primitive does several independent things, splitting those things apart to provide future flexibility. On the other hand, there is value in demonstrating the correct way to combine them for a specific task. The whole question of whether a primitive should be a pre primitive or a library function can be a difficult design decision. And my second observation is that BibTeX style language doesn't do a good job of supporting libraries. If I were to provide a complete re-implementation re of format.name, then a copy of that would have to be included in every single BST file that wants to use it. It would be great if BibTeX style language had an include command, but it doesn't. So I don't have a way to do that kind of factoring. Third operation, in a stack language, deconstructors can be very valuable. And this may show up in pattern matching in some kinds of languages. Um, a simple example is given a string, I might want to, to decompose that into the fir first character of the string and all the rest. And it might be an ASCII character or a text character, which is what makes, this, uh, what makes this interesting. This is the ASCII character version that I've shown here. So primitives that take a few things on the stack and return multiple things on the stack are actually a very powerful idea in a programming language of this kind. Curiously, none of the primitives they provided return multiple things. So that's a kind of linguistic power that they left on the table there. Another example, so when I'm processing ISO 8601 dates, I've got a, I've got a subroutine that takes a string on the stack, and when it's done, it's left eight parts on the stack. It leaves the year, month, day, hour, minute, second, time zone, and season. That's like name decomposition on steroids. And in fact, a very simple primitive that I wish were in the language is something I would all split at. So given a string and something that might be a substring of it, if it is a substring, then it leaves on the stack what was on either side of its leftmost occurrence. So here I can split this date at the first hyphen. And I get back the part to the left, the part to the right, and a one. But if there was no hyphen there, then I get the same string back unsplit, and I leave a zero there. And the reason for leaving the one or the zero there is that makes it very convenient to use it in control structure. And here are typical control structure idioms. I can take a date, try to split it at a slash. And if there was a slash, that means there were really two dates there. I've got the two dates here and I can process an ISO date range. And if there wasn't a slash, then it's only one date and I can process it here. And the fact that I left a one or a zero meant that if could easily make the decision for me. Similarly, I can repeatedly split a date at its hyphens. And as long as there is a hyphen, then I've got two things on the stack, I can swap them and process the next item. And when finally there is no hyphen, then I can process the last item. So this kind of primitive works very well as a predicate for an if statement or a while loop. Now, what about abstract data types in this language? It doesn't really have any. But if we think of the integers and the strings as an abstract data type, we can, from our vantage point as a language designer, we realize sometimes it's a good idea to, comply to provide a complete or expected or symmetric set of operations, even if you think not all the operations will be used in practice. This provides user flexibility, uh, meets user expectations, and can help prevent misuse. For example, this language provides both a less than and a greater than function. It didn't need both. It could provide less than, and if you want the other, you swap and then use less than to get greater than but they chose, chose to provide a greater than primitive. For integers, should we provide multiply and divide, bitwise and or an XOR? Should we provide shifting operations? Well, they haven't needed that much. For strings, should we find a way to find a substring or better yet split it at that substring? I think so. Should we provide both kinds of length on ASCII characters and on so-called text characters? Should we provide split operations on both kinds? Those are questions to ask. For functions, do we want things that operate on functions like call and map and map reduce? Do we want, should we have function valued variables? Would that make the language more flexible? If you choose not to provide those primitives, then the designer can at least think about how such operations might be programmed in terms of existing primitives. Maybe you don't provide exactly these operations, but if you provide the building blocks, things like type testing primitives to help you with it. This leads me to my fifth observation. More generally, 
I think it's a good idea to think hard about primitives to probe and affect the programming environment. It'd be great if there were a way to find out the type of a stack item, to access the size of the stack, to get at any stack slot without having to pop the stack. To get at the values of macro names, I think this one would be the biggest bang for the buck. A way to find out all the names of all the fields in entry, even if you didn't declare them, because that would allow you to do some error reporting uh, and to construct your good debugging tools. Sometimes it's a good idea um, Yes, okay. I was confused about where I went on slides. Final set of observations. Sometimes the application domain just shifts on you and you need a major overhaul. An example is sometimes you find that month, year, and day isn't isn't good enough. You need a full ISO date. Maybe you need to maybe it's time to bite the bullet and support UTF-8, not just ASCII. And that will be a major rewrite. And I think because it's been a major rewrite, it hasn't happened yet. I noticed that implementing UTF-8 in BibTech would actually fit well within its current organization because you could just treat UTF characters as text characters. They have these multi-character blobs that act like single characters. There's already a concept of that in BibTech. So to wrap up, this is the wrap up of what I think I've learned about designing domain specific languages from studying BibTech and what they did do and what they didn't do. I'm not going to characterize them as strengths and weaknesses or successes and failures. I think they were successes in their design context at the time and the application context has shifted. A domain specific language does need to address its specific name and address it well and to address it conveniently. But I think any domain specific language also needs to be a language. It needs features to support the dynamic main, but it also needs features that support the idea of being a language and things like being able to probe your environment, being able to test your data are things that have to do with being a language. And there are design trade-offs between doing one specific thing well and providing a set of more primitive things that leaves room for programming, future programming of variations. So the domain may change, but the designer can ask when the domain changes, and I don't know yet how it's going to change. Have I left room for the language to change with it? If so, can these languages be made from within the language? In particular, can I use the language to construct things that look like new primitives and have kind of the power of the primitives I've already provided? And if so, does the design of the language make such changes easy or hard? And uh, does it su provide support for things like libraries and refactoring? And that's where things like the idea of putting an include feature in a bibtech comes from. So that is the end of my talk. That's what I had to say, and that is what I have learned. I hope you found that interesting, and I'd be happy to take time to answer questions. I may not have left a lot of time for that, but uh, that's it.